Shalom, good morning, and welcome to CMJ Canada. And uh, I'm my name's Aaron. I'm sitting still in Canada House in sunny Israel, and we're wrestling with, I think, the best book of the Bible, Leviticus. And the two Torah portions that we're going to be um, looking at today is uh, Shemini and uh, Tsaari. And this is from Leviticus 9 through to Leviticus um, uh, 13. And so, uh, and then the corresponding Haftarah portions, which are in Second Samuel and in in Kings. So we're hearing a, a little bit also from the voices of the kings and the prophets. So I'm going to open up in a in a, a word of prayer, and then and then we'll wrestle the the, the scriptures together. And so Father in heaven, we would ask that uh, your face uh, would be upon your people this day that uh, for this Shabbat they would know rest that they would know um, comfort from their time of war that they would know peace in their hearts Pray, Lord that your angels will defend them and as we open up your scriptures today that we would see fresh again your love and your protection your wisdom and your authority Lord the, uh, the glories of your kingdom in its fullest. So we pray this in the name of our risen Messiah, for that also we celebrate this season of Easter. Shem Yeshua. Amen. And when you think about it, there's a lot to celebrate. So here we go. And uh, we're looking at the the first um, Torah portion and then the Haftarah portion. The Torah portion is um, from Leviticus 9 to 11. And the Haftarah portion is from 2 Samuel 6, the, the first 19 verses, for those that want to thumbnail along. We're going to jump back and forward and back and forward. So the, the Torah portion starts by saying, it came to pass on the eighth day, that's where you get the, uh, the word Shmini from, the eighth. Moses calls Aaron and his sons and the elders, and they, they, they do the sort of handover from Moses to Aaron, and so he can start basically the Levitical priesthood. So the basic priestly ministry begins right now in this Torah portion, and um, uh, which is an interesting thing. Moses has been acting as priest for an entire week, but now he will stop and he will never act as priest again. He will only act as judge and, and prophet and, and sort of ruler. Aaron now takes up the mantle of priesthood, and his sons. And uh, you might think, well, he's kind of been doing this already. Well, yes, and no, but here is actually really the official one. And uh, there's all kinds of, the, the ceremony is really, the whole chapter is this giant ceremony as to, to which animals you kill and where you put various sprinklings and, 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 and how you make everything holy and get everything all set up. What's interesting for me in just this, just this is Aaron has already done the golden cow. And yet he's still going to be rewarded with a priesthood and his descendants. And we will always now hear of the descendants of Aaron. But we will never hear of the descendants of Miriam or the descendants of Moses. As important as, important as those characters are, are, they will sit in the pages of Torah, but their descendants will not. They'll, be, they'll have no influence, their descendants have no influence on the people of Israel. Aaron's will. And uh, even though he is a fundamentally flawed human being, what an interesting thing when you talk about the priesthood of all believers and the fundamental flooring that we all have and yet we carry on to have an effect on uh, onto the world. So they're going to start the priestly system. Fantastic. They've built the tabernacle. They spent all this time in Exodus talking about it. It's now time to actually get together and have it function uh, in society. And then the next thing that encounters is Leviticus 10 is a, is a piece of narrative. Now, normally in Leviticus, it's, it's a series of rules. Aaron, uh, God says to Moses, Moses says to Aaron, do this, do that, don't do this, don't do this. This is how you kill this cow. This is which bits you're allowed to eat. These kinds of things. But in, in chapter 10, you have a narrative sequence. You have a story. Very rare in Leviticus. And so here you have just set up the priestly system. And the first story about the priestly system 
is it doesn't work. Right? You go, huh? So we're looking at verse 1 of 10. Then Nadav and Avihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his own censer, put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered a profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord, devoured them, and they died before the Lord. And Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. And before all people, I must be glorified. So Aaron held his peace. I mean, uh, what the story is 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 rather shocking. Moses, uh, Aaron has four sons. These are his two eldest, Nadav and Avihu, who have had all the right training, the same as Aaron has. They have actually been on the mountain with Moses and Aaron, fellowshipping with the Lord. So in Exodus, it'll say Moses, Aaron, Nadav and Avihu, and the 70 elders go and, and, uh, and have a meal occasion and fellowship with the Lord. And here, they do something inappropriate. Not 100% sure what it is, because it's just called, in, in my Bible here, it's a, which is a New King James profane fire, but in Hebrew, it just says strange fire. Uh, something that wasn't was not supposed to be there, and um, fire comes out and actually burns them. So a couple of and then Moses holds his his peace. His, Moses is silent; he doesn't um, go into a hissy fit. He doesn't wail and mourn. He he doesn't do anything. Um, he he is is silent. And so there's a couple of things that we that we pick up immediately is uh, is Nadav and Avi who were with God. Now they are burnt by God, and as they start the, the the service, why does God, when He's not on the mountain, or who knows everything, right? God knows everything. That's the usual um, thing we say. God is um, omnipotent, right, and omnipresent. He's everywhere, and He knows everything. So uh, you've got it's. Uh, Unauthorized fire. Yep, sure. That's an, uh, profane, unauthorized, strange. The the fire that's not supposed to be there. Why does God, when He's on the mountain with them in in uh, Exodus, why does He not say Nadav Avihu and just burn them there? Like why let them go through all this stuff? He knows they're going to blow it now. Why does He not deal with them then? And uh, for the the sages, the Jewish sages, they wrestle with this and go, "Wow, what is what is God thinking?" And so they come to this uh, interesting saying or phrase: "God judges in the moment." So even though he knows the future, so he judges in in the moment. He doesn't. If he knows you will be a very bad person, he doesn't just wipe you out now. Well, why not? Because right now, you're innocent and you're pure. In the future, you might not be. And so, um, uh, but you can also repent. And what does repentance mean? Repentance means to return. Return to where? Return back to that pure moment. Right? So there's this, you know, you, you will, oh, bad, 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 and you could get a good judge, a bad judgment, but then... Repent, and you're back in the pure moment. Um, and so, but what sort of thing did they do so wrong? Well, the, the 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 sages look at it and they go, "Well, first of all, each took his own censer. There was no sharing. They they didn't work together. They tried uh, to be separate and independent. They weren't talking to each other. So there was miscommunication. Which is in a, they weren't working together to sort of correct themselves. So when studying the Bible, they the, the sages would say it's best to do it together. Okay? If you just have quiet time all on your own, it's the only form of Bible study you ever do, then there's a good chance you might start getting things wrong. So best to have that counterbalance, right? And so when you get to a yeshiva world, you always got two people, always two people arguing, right? Um, and then they put uh, fire and incense, but that wasn't the appropriate, it wasn't 
something that should sort of that they should have been using. What incense may have they done? They might have taken the Lord's incense. Remember in Exodus, there's a special uh, ingredient or eleven ingredients where God says, "This is my smell. You can have whatever smell you like, but this one's mine. You, know, you don't use it for anything else." And um, and the other thing is in verse eight of Leviticus uh, not ten, it says, "When the the Lord spoke to Aaron, saying, now Lord spoke to Aaron, not to Moses." Very rare that the Lord goes direct to Aaron. Somebody goes straight to Aaron and says, "Don't drink wine or intoxicating drink. You." nor your sons with you when you go into the tabernacle lest you die. So it could be that the Nadav and Avi, Avi who had, um, were intoxicated, didn't realize what they were doing, acted inappropriately, particularly bringing, um, being unholy before the Lord. And then their own sin is what ate them, right? They brought in false fire, they're devoured by fire. And that's often the way that evil is destroyed. Evil is often destroyed by itself, by the things that it does. So um, greed catches up with people and they're destroyed by greed. Those who live by the sword are killed by the sword, right? They, not usually by cancer, but by the sword, this sort of idea. But um, there's something that Nadav and Avi who did, they couldn't, they did something inappropriate, though they had been trained correctly. And... Uh, the, the, before we go into the Haftara portion, then there's this, um, uh, oh, and Aaron is silent. Like he doesn't say anything. And so this is actually a um, uh, where the sages get the, the idea of when you visit someone who's mourning, like sitting Sherva, that's actually lost someone, you're quiet. You don't initiate conversation. You stay silent until the person who's mourning is ready to speak. And you see this when Job's three friends arrive. For the first week, they sit around and do nothing. Then they start opening their mouths and getting it all wrong. But uh, you, what you're supposed to do is go to someone who's um, suffering and just be quiet and let them begin the conversation, whatever the conversation is and whatever they want to talk about. And so in terms of being silent, uh, we all know that we have two ears and one mouth. We all know that we always use them in the wrong proportion. And uh, the sages have their own little take on this. They'll say, in youth, one learns to talk, to speak, and in maturity, he learns to be quiet. This is actually man's problem, that he actually learns to talk before he learns to be quiet. So we're always shooting our mouth off. You know? But even though having wisdom to sometimes actually be, be silent is itself a power and an important, an important strength. And then in this Torah portion, you get the uh, the, the the kosher laws, the what you foods that are um, permitted and the foods that are forbidden. And what's interesting about the list is it only lists the animals that are forbidden, it never lists the animals that are permitted. Okay? It just gives you a blanket line. It'll say the Lord speaks to Moses and Aaron. Now it's not just Aaron. Now it's not just Moses. It's uh, Moses and Aaron, saying, speak to the children of Israel. Say to everybody. Okay? And then this is what you can do. These are the animals which you can eat, and these are the animals uh, among all the ones on the earth. Among the animals that divides the hoof, having cloven hooves, chewing the cud. Those you can. And then it gives you this list of animals that you can't eat. Okay? The swine, the... the um, uh, what else? Uh, the rock hyrax, things like that, the camel, right? Uh, and it lists the actual animals by name, but it doesn't tell you the ones you can actually eat. You have to discern that. And that's where this is, a, is we often focus just purely on the food bits. You know, look, look at these, um, this kosher law, and, and the Jewish people go, actually, it's a lot, lot deeper than that. This is actually a discussion on discernment. And the ability to differentiate between pure and impure, good and evil, right from wrong, or the sacred from the profane. Now, profanity in our Western culture is usually uh, defined as language. You know, when someone swears, we say that is profanity. But profanity in, or profaneness in, uh, in, the, in the Jewish mindset in the Hebraic mindset, is the opposite of sacred. 
Sacred is something holy. Sacred is something very special. Sacred is something unique and not common. Profanity, profaneness is common. That doesn't mean it's evil. It just means it's common. It's normal. And it's and so there's it's and it's the opposite of the not normal. And God is sacred. He is not common. Uh, and the, the all the people have to learn how to differentiate or discern between pure and impure, between sacred and profane. It is not just the role of the leadership or the clergy. This is where you get the the, the idea of the priesthood of all believers. We are all part of the discernment process you know in, in terms of like the the body of the messiah one of the fruits of the spirit is discernment and uh but we need to discern as a society and as people and as individuals you know um male from female right from wrong light from day common and uncommon and it looks like our friends nadav and avihu had failed to do that maybe because they were intoxicated but they had failed to differentiate and discern appropriately. And failure to make a, a good discernment is um, is dangerous. Obviously, for Nadav and Abihu, it's very dangerous, but also for a society. Once we have failed to make distinctions and the blinds are all blurred, it begins, the society begins to uh, to collapse. It's dangerous. And so, for example, in the Sabbath, the Sabbath is sacred and holy. The other days are called the profane days. They're common. They're not evil. And Sunday is not evil. Monday is not evil. Tuesday is the day of double blessing. That's the day you go get married, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it's it's the it's the they're not the same as the Sabbath. And once we've turned all days the same, right? Society begins to have issues. And you, which we can see in our our current our current uh, thing, we should also notice that when you read uh, um, Leviticus eleven, it'll say things like in verse eight, "Their flesh you shall not eat, their carcass you will not touch. It is unclean for you." Uncleanness or impurity is not a sin. Okay, so it's not a sin to eat pork. So on, on Yom Kippur, uh, there is five prayers that you pray during that day. Normally you have three prayers a day, but on Yom Kippur there are two that are added. And one of them is called Al-Chet. And you only pray this prayer on Yom Kippur. And Al-Chet means all sins. And it is a 20 to 25 minute prayer. And it is this long confession on, and it just names sins. Forgive me, Lord, for committing adultery. Forgive me, Lord, for committing embezzlement. Forgive me, Lord, for killing my neighbor. Forgive me, Lord, for you know, just you know, saying bad things, thinking bad thoughts, um, doing bad things, not doing good things. There's this long list. I mean, you thought, for those of you who may or may not go to um, traditional churches and have you know, times of confessions and little, little uh, orders of service, think, oh, man. It's quite a long confession. How boring is that? You have never been to a Jewish Alchet, okay? It is, goes on, and it names absolutely everything under the sun. What it doesn't say is there's no prayer that says, forgive me, Lord, for eating pork. Right? That's not there. It makes you unclean. It's forbidden, so don't do it. But if you are unclean, you can get clean. And this is why Jesus was so obvious when he says, look, it's not what goes in your mouth, all right? It's what comes out, okay? And... Um, uh, so these were the things that, uh, but if you touch them, so uncleanness or impurity was actually transferable, just like holiness. So at the same time as we are salt and light in the community, we can infect the community with our salt and our light. We have to remember that when we touch some the community, we engage with it, it can also affect us. Okay? And so there's, there's, we have to be, always on the defensive. And so, again, pairs of uh, are, are good. Don't go in alone. Go together. Work together. And then, of course, then you get, of course, the, the New Testament model of Jesus where he sends out his disciples two by two. Okay? He, he doesn't leave them alone. He puts them in 
in groups and in, and in pairings. So this is the background for the Haftarah portion, which was chosen, and they chose it from the prophets. They chose it from um, 2 Samuel, and it's 6. And uh, it's the story of David bringing the ark into Jerusalem. I mean, it's a really cool story. We all know it. Uh, the, the, the background, the ark had been lost in battle. And because um, the, the the children of Israel taken the ark to battle, and by the way, that's not a sin that you were supposed to do stuff like that. Okay, um, but they had lost, and the ark had been captured by the Philistines. The Philistines had put it in their temple, and um, all their gods had kept pulling down and getting smashed. And uh, there was a bit of a plague, and they all discovered, oops, we should shouldn't have this thing. So they put it on a cart, and then they uh, the animals um, bring it back to somewhere near Beth Shemesh. David's decided that he's going to bring it to Jerusalem. He is not going to bring it into the temple. It hasn't been built. Right? He's going to bring it into a tent he made. Right? He's not bringing it into the tabernacle. The tabernacle's gone. No one knows where that is anymore. He's going to be bringing it into David's tent. And uh, remember, this is the thing that the prophets say. Let's rebuild David's fallen tent. And they don't say let's they don't say let's rebuild the temple, they don't say let's re rebuild the tabernacle, they say build this thing. Okay, there's something about this mysterious unknown tent that uh, David created uh, where he would um, put the ark in. So, chapter six of 2 Samuel begins. Again, David gathered all the choice men of Israel around 30,000. Okay, and now remember, all doesn't mean all. All means a majority or a goodly representation or something like that. And David arose and went with all the people who were with him from uh, Baalei Yehuda. Now, notice the name Baalei. Okay, we, we, Baal, and we normally, as as uh, um, readers of the Bible, we we hear the word Baal and we go <gasps> pagan. Okay, Canaanite uh, storm god, and also that's true. I was a Canaanite storm god, but it's also a Hebrew word, okay? And uh, there's lots of things in Hebrew called Baal that has nothing to do with the pagan god, okay? Including the word husbands, by the way, in Hebrew are called a Baal, right? And um, most husbands, yeah, might be pagans, but, um, but uh, you know, they, they're they not inherently evil just because they have that name. So there was this village, Baal Yehuda. The husbands of Judah, or the masters of Judah, or the lords of Judah—you know—that that, that could easy, easy, easily any one of those names would fit. And uh, this is where they were going to set out from to bring the Ark of God, whose name is called by the name Hashem, the Lord of Hosts, which is a uh, military term. Right? His name here is Commander of Armies. Okay? The Lord is a warrior, which is actually what you get from Exodus. It actually does state clearly that the Lord is a warrior and he's a he's he's a, a fighter. And um uh, and he dwells between the cherubim. He dwells between these angels which are sitting on top of this ark. And uh uh it's very important for them because that's where they believe that God would, would sit and go come and meet his people. What they were thinking of where was God, had God actually been captured, not sure. Text not all that clear as to what they physically thought about um, where God was, but they 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 um, acknowledged that he God had said, "I will meet you between the cherubim." So obviously the ark was important. So let's bring it into the Jerusalem. Sounds great. So they set the ark of God on a new cart and they brought it out of the house of Avinadav. Notice the name, right? Whose Torah portion have we just read? Nadav and Avihu. Now the ark had been sitting in the house of Avi Nadav. My father is Nadav. Okay? Um, so there's a little connection there. And uh, the sons of Avi Nadav, this is Uza and Achio, they drove the new cart because they put the ark of God on a new cart. They didn't, they didn't use the one that had come in. They got a new one. And... Um, and they brought it out of the house of Avinadav, which was on the, on the hill, whatever hill that meant. Okay. I always 
You know, uh, the Bible always just name says there's things called hills or mountains, and it never tells you their name. Um, the, the New Testament does exactly the same thing. Okay, Jesus will say Jesus took his disciples up a hill, but I won't tell you which one. Okay, you'll go to Israel today, and you'll go, "That's Mount Arbel. That's the hill." This and they all got names, but somehow in the New Testament they didn't. Okay, they probably did, but for some reason it was never biblical to put the name of the mountain. There's a few. Very few mountains that are named, right? Mount Zion, Mount uh, Mor Moriah, okay? Mount Horeb, um, Mount of Olives. Very few, okay? The, the rest, everything else just gets this generic thing. So there's a guy with a house on a hill. Great. And his name's Avinadav. And they put the ark on that and, they, and then accompanying the ark of God. So it's a really special, powerful name. Achio goes in front, Uzzah goes behind. Then David and all the house of Israel, remember all doesn't mean all, there's no possible way, all Israel went to this one little place, there's just not enough room. Plus, I mean, people, someone's living in the Golan, no, no one's going to leave their villages unguarded. Okay? He's playing music before the Lord on all kinds of instruments, a fir wood, on harps, on string instruments, tambourine, cisterns, and cymbals. Remember, David's quite musical. He's an interesting character. He has the ability to compartmentalize certain things in, in his life. He can kill giants and chop their heads off. He can write love songs. He's the same guy. He loves music, quite the musician. And when they came to Nachon's threshing floor, no one knows exactly where that is, okay, but it's somewhere near Kiryat Yerim, okay, or, or modern day, or Kiryat Yerim is a modern, not modern city. It's near um, Meveseret today if you happen to be anywhere knowing the geography of jerusalem uzzah put his hand to the ark of god took hold of it for the oxen had stumbled and then the anger of the lord was aroused against uzzah god struck him there for his error and he died there by the ark of god what should he have done should he have let the ark fall i mean box would have split open i mean what's going on he just Put his hand out to, to stop. People are worshipping the Lord and playing all kinds of music. Hillsong revival going on right now. And then something happens. And what does it say? So first of all, the Lord's anger is aroused. He gets angry and does this. Now, anger, not a sin. Okay? The Lord is angry. He's an emotional being too. And David becomes angry uh, because of the Lord's outbreak against Uzzah. And he called the name of the place Peretz Uzzah to this day. Then David was afraid. So his anger to any, uh, gets afraid of the Lord. And he says, how can the Lord come to me? So David would not move the ark, puts him in the city of, to put him in the city of David. He takes him to the house of Oved Edom, the slave of Edom, the servant of Edom, who is a Gittite, a Gentile. Okay? And, uh, and the, the, Lord, the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Oved Edom, the Gittite, for three months. And the Lord blessed Obed Edom and all his household. So David has a hissy fit. David is going to bring the ark into Jerusalem. It doesn't work out for him. David's like, that's it. I'm not going to touch it. Okay, fine, God. You can do whatever you like, buddy. And uh, I ain't going to be worrying about this. And um, is David's reaction correct? No. What's wrong with Uzzah? Why did he fall? Well, this again comes back to the Torah portion. The ability to discern the sacred and the profane. Now, Uzzah had been living with the ark for who knows how long, right? Quite some time, years. So he was very familiar with this holy object. Perhaps familiarity breeds contempt. And instead of considering it holy, he is now considering it common. Maybe. But the ark should not, right, he's not a Levite, should not have been carried this way. The Bible gives you clear instructions as to how to carry the ark. Levites carry the ark, not Kohens, Levites. And uh, it's carried on poles, not on carts. So they had not discerned, they had inappropriately done something with the box and God was angry and Uzzah had failed to discern correctly 
And as we said before, and I'll say it again, failure to discern okay, has tragic consequences. So if we think about our current society, our inability to make distinctions, which is a societal thing, it's not just for leaders to do. Aaron and Moses, you tell the sons of Israel to do this. Okay? They make distinctions. Uzzah, regardless of whether he's a Levite or not, shouldn't have touched the ark. Well, if he was a Levite, he probably should have been carrying the darn thing. Um, but uh, but but he he has failed in his distinction. Nadav and Avihu have failed to make the appropriate distinctions, and our societies currently today is failing to make distinctions, and it has tragic consequences, and uh, that's uh, tragic consequences for for all of us. But once uh, the uh, once the the David. David then hears a bit later. It says, now it was told King David, this is verse 12, told King David saying, the Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David hears that everything about this Gentile now is going really well. Okay, His shares are up. Um, his wife's pregnant. His kid's pregnant. His cat's pregnant. I mean, you name it, everything's done. His his vines of, have got the best grapes ever. It doesn't matter what this guy touches, it's, it's liquid gold. And David goes, wow. So for three months, right, uh, David hasn't done anything. And now he hears, oh, it's going really well for him. Well, I want a piece of that pie. Okay, so bring me, bring me uh, the ark and let's do it properly this time. So they do it properly. And um, this time, um, they do, they put the, the ark is born by um, uh, Levites. David makes lots of sacrifices for the Lord. He does not have to. This is now completely free will offerings. And each of these animals would be then shared amongst people, like a bit would be given for God. And uh, is David supposed to wear the priestly garment? Aha, that's a good question. And um, because it says, David was wearing an ephod. And you go, hang on a second. Is he allowed to do that? Now, here's where the Hebrew gets a little, um, it's not exactly uh, clear, because he's wearing not a ephod, the ephod. He's wearing a ephod. And um, and you go, well, what does that actually mean? Has he actually tried to replicate something? Because the ephod, right, is the, supposed to be on the breastplate of the high priest. And that's going to have all the little gems on and um, be sort of like communication device. So it's, it's a, it becomes a question, is David actually acting as king priest here? So there will be some sages go, yes, this is a clear sign. Messiah is a king priest. Okay. Um, how? David shouldn't is from Judah. He shouldn't be priestly at all. So this, this this then causes other sages to turn around and go, oh, I look, you know, absolutely not. There's no way that um, uh, this was actually a high priestly garment. He was just dressed a little bit like that, but it wasn't actually the high priestly garment. It was just, you know, just sort of thing. Um, but look at him, you know, and he, and 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 then they, they start saying, so what? What else was he wearing? Well, the text doesn't say he was wearing anything else. Okay, so is David running around showing all his bits off, his unmentionables, or is he actually got underwear on? And is this just just talking like that? Um, not sure. So, so, so sages go either way. Some will say he is really acting inappropriately, that literally dancing naked before the Lord. Others will say, no, 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 no. He's 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 covered up. Don't worry. He's covered up. He's looking very regal, actually, um, although not in full refinery. He's been very pacific with his garments. Uh, he's he's leaping. He's shouting. He's got lots of music. He's sacrificing, and then his daughter, his uh, wife Michal, okay, um, Saul's daughter gets. She has her hissy fit, okay, and then um, uh, that causes a strained relationship between the two. And uh, the concluding story is that uh, she doesn't. David actually no, no longer um, has any fellowship with her, and she has no children. The text doesn't say the Lord is angry with Michal. 
Okay, they could have just sorted this out. So again, Michal can't discern um, between appropriate and inappropriate worship. David can't quite discern what should I be doing with my wife or not with my wife. Um, so at the same time as they've figured out some discernment, they're failing at others. So discernment is a um, something that you do constantly, something that you have to be aware of constantly, um, and it's not something uh, that something that we have to all be a part of. We're actually all invited to be a part of the discernment process because the consequences are actually tragic. For David, uh, it had resulted in the death of Uzzah and an estrangement with his wife. Okay, Jerusalem now has the ark in it. That's fantastic. Obed Edom, he got blessed. So whenever God does something, there's, there's sometimes something that goes bad for some people and positive for some others. Uh, and so the, the Torah portion and the Haftarah portion invite us to learn discernment, which is one of the fruits of the Spirit. Okay, the next Torah portion is um, Leviticus 12, called, it's called Sa'ariah, and which is, uh, it, which is the word for conception. Okay, it discusses, because remember the Torah, the teachings and instructions of God, handle every aspect of um, society. Okay. Not just how you worship God, but uh, childbirth, um, uh, agriculture, slaves, economy, you know, the poor, everything, the land, how you're supposed to handle the, the, the agriculture. Okay. So the Lord speaks to Moses, saying, speak to the children of Israel. So now everyone's having a go. So if a woman conceives and bears a male, then she'll be unclean, okay? uncleanliness. But uncleanliness is not a sin. Why is it not a sin? Because they've actually fulfilled the commandment to go multiply. So this is this can't possibly be sinful. It just means that she is in, dif to, in discerning. She's holy, but now she's common. She was special. Now she's so we need to get her pure again. And um, the because purity is a really big deal. Okay, so so the the this Torah portion called Sa'aria, which discusses childbirth and uh, some sort of skin disease, okay, um, is one of those very earthy Torah portions where it seems um, it doesn't affect most of us. Most of us don't have um, horrible skin diseases, and um, half the population is never going to give birth. Uh, so, so it's a very earthy portion, but the rabbis will always say, listen, this is divine language. This is a, every utterance from God is pure. Every utterance from God is pure. Um, and if if something, so that means all the good, horrible bits that are in, the good bits that are in the Bible and all the horrible bits. If there's something in the Bible that makes us uncomfortable, then our discomfort is not God's problem. That's our problem. And when we read the Bible and go, oh, I don't, I don't really like that then that's your problem. That's not God's problem. Everything God says is pure. So as Paul says, the Torah is holy, just, and good. Our problem is we're very bad at discerning it. Okay? That's the, one of the things that we're, we're trying to um, put into practice uh, here. All right. So um, the, here you've got an issue that uh, the lady is unclean. And so there's something that she has to do on the eighth day. Uh, they'll circumcise the, the boy if he's a male. And then um, for 33 days, she continues impure. And then when she's allowed back into the, the, the sanctuary, she must not touch, right? The, the word is touch any other um, unholy thing. This, this idea of touch is, is something that they, 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 they focus on. Okay? The ability for, for when you touch something to have an effect on it. Positive or negative. Um, here, she's in an impure state. So when she touches something, she'll make it impure. And um, if we have a look at what she's allowed to bring, is she's supposed to bring an uh, an animal, uh, a lamb. Now, this is something from the herd. This is not grain, and uh, and so therefore, it's actually a more expensive offering. But if you're poor. See, you can't do this. If you're having lots of kids, there's definitely no way you can do this. So if you're poor, you can just bring pigeons or turtle doves. And that's exactly what you see Mary doing. Mary and Joseph in the Gospels do exactly this. 
and they um, and and they're following the purification laws, and uh, they bring in two total loaves. So we know that Yeshua Jesus is born into a poor family. The Magi haven't visited yet; they haven't given the gold. Okay. Um, and they haven't fled to Egypt or any of that kind of stuff. That's coming later. But at the, at the time that they start, they are, he's, in, he's born into a poor, uh, a poor, a poor pious family. So the um, in it doesn't say here that you have to pay anything. I mean, obviously you have to pay uh, for the 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 turtles, the turtle doves, or the or the or the lamb. Um, in modern you know, in modern Judaism, you have a thing called the Pidiyat Ben, the redeem, redeeming of the firstborn. You pay money, and there's no obligation here to pay anything. Okay? And uh, so, where do you get this idea that you that you have to? Um, the, the, there's a midrash, and they talk about this. It, they say the midrash doesn't define how much money you're supposed to pay to get rid of or to become pure. Um, and the question is, just because you're not obliged to, does that mean you shouldn't? So that's their discussion. Right? Just because you're not obliged to do any payment or anything, does that mean you shouldn't? And, and uh, their conclusion is, um, just because you're not told to do something doesn't mean you shouldn't, that you should not do it. This sort of, you know, this sort of the idea of being the innocent bystander. Uh, no one told me I had to intervene. No one told me I had to speak up, so I didn't. There was no obligation for me to help the little old lady to cross the street. There was no obligation for me to call the police. You know, the, all these kinds of, there's no rule to do X. And so there's lots and lots of no rules. But you have to discern, you have to differentiate, you have to figure this out. Am I actually obliged to do this, even if it's not written down? Often the answer is yes. So they would say, you go do this. In fact, they would say, actually, um, if things are not obliged, they often don't get done. And so therefore, that's why the rabbis make lots of rules, so that you actually do them. Okay, This sort of idea that if we don't put these rules on you, you won't do them. So... Um, and they, they can't handle that. They, they, they want people to actually learn some sort of uh, discerning. And, uh, and so they, and they focus a little bit on this, this touch idea of um, the ability that when you, that you, when you enter the world and, and touch the world, you have an effect on the world, but the world has an effect on you. And this ability to discern and, and, and trying to maintain purity, um, so much so that they then run off on a tangent Okay, and their uh, their tangent is um, trying to figure out who touches who, right? And and what is the reaction? Is Israel touching the world, or is at the same time as the world touching Israel? And how do we create the the boundaries and the barriers, and how do we form our protections? Um, and so there's this discussion between um, Rabbi Kiva and a Roman senator, actually a, a consul, but. He eventually gets to the Senate. But at the time of the discussion, he's a consul. And his name is um, Turnus Rufus, so, you know, one of these real characters. And uh, they often would have a um, discussions. And uh, Turnus Rufus is a pagan. He's not a believer. He's always challenging Akiva on matters of faith. And he's listening to Akiva talk about um, the effect that Israel should have on the world as a light to the nations. And Tunis Rufus sticks his hands up and he goes, oh, you guys can't do that. Because surely, Rabbi, are not the things God does much better than the things humans do? Right? I mean, what possible effect can you have on the world as a human? Let God do it. You know? um, nice little challenge. Yes. Okay. So he asked the rabbi straight up, which is better, Rabbi? Things humans do or the things God does? And what answer do you think? Rabbi Akiva would give. Some of us might think, well, it's definitely things God does. I mean, he, he creates the world and, and he does miracles and he parts the Red Sea, blah, 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 blah. The rabbi says, oh, it's what humans do. And Jonas Rufus says, oh, silly rabbi. You know, you're supposed to be the, the wise in Israel. How can this possibly be? Prove it. And Rabbi Akiva says, 
actually what it says in the in the in the Talmud in the discussion, Rabbi Kiva says, kind of thought you'd ask me this question, so I've prepared my response. And he brings out a kernel of wheat, and he brings out a fresh loaf of bread. And he says, which one of these is better? And the and the the Roman goes, well, of course the fresh loaf of bread. He goes, good, because that's the one man made. That's the one God made. And look what we did with what God did. And you go, interesting thought. Does not Jesus say, you will do greater things than me? But you're Jesus. You died on the cross. You ro rose from the dead. You're supercalifragilistic and exbialidocious boss. And Jesus says, that's also true. But you will go out and do great things. Right? You have the Holy Spirit. That's that little kernel of wheat. Now go out and discern. Go out and touch the world. Go out and make things better. And uh, fight back the darkness. Heal people. Bring the light. These kinds of things. And so there's this, there's this uh, interesting little element. And they, how you go, how did the rabbis go from we can touch the world positively from looking at, and this is what women do when they're given birth. Yeah, but that's how you know rabbis read the Bible. They they look at everything in the text is pure. It has to be. It's from God. So they they play with this word um, the touch. Okay. And the other thing now that the, the last little thing is um, is on uh, uh, what's called tsa'arat. So Tsa'ariya is the uh, Torah portion. That's where you conceive. But the, the Torah portion contains um, number, uh, number 13, Leviticus 13, which is uh, the heading says it's about leprosy. It's called Tsa'arat. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron. Okay, not just Aaron, not just Moses, both of them. Uh, and, and when a man has on his skin uh, a swelling or some sort of bright spot, um, then it could be, Sa'arat. No one knows what that means. Okay, so it could be leprosy. That's often the way we translate it, but it really, it's not the word for leprosy. Uh, it is now, but it's that's but we no one's one hundred percent sure what it means. Okay, um, what do you do? Do you go to the doctor? No, go to a priest. Okay, that's strange. Surely, if you've got something on your skin, you'd go to a go to a doctor wouldn't you like usually if one of us here has um you know some back aches or something you go see the doc okay uh i've got this strange mole on my skin you go see the doctor you don't run to a priest here run to a priest something about this text says you need a priest not a doctor okay so the sages are now trying to look beyond the physical and again it uses the word touch okay uh, and it says um it, it just describes when the man has on his skin that he has a touch on his skin. Something's happened. What has he been touched by, one wonders? And uh, the text doesn't say, and so they leap to the same idea of how do you impact or touch the world? What is better? Is it something that God does or is it something that men do? Um, how do we work through this? Um, and the, the, uh, the Haftara portion happens to come from 2 Kings 4. So looking at 2 Kings 4, picking it up at verse uh, 42, and it's going to be where Naaman has his leprosy, his, his um, skin disease healed. So that's how they leap into this. And um, it starts with... Uh, a man, an unnamed man, bringing uh, bread of special bread, 20 loaves of barley bread uh, from his knapsack and says, give it to the people. And the servant says, but why? There's this four, the, the, uh, can I put these, this, this barley bread in front of 100 men? He says, give it. And then there's a miracle. You know how Jesus did the miracle of the uh, you know five loaves and two fish? Well, it already happened. You know, remember that in um, uh, in the New Testament, there's there's a, not a lot of new set in inverted commas. Okay, things had, had in many cases actually happened before, um, um, but just because something's not new doesn't mean it's not special. Okay, that's the other thing that I sometimes 
remember. Remember, Jesus says, uh, I, a new commandment I give you is to love one another. Well, G Moses already said love. Okay, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor. Okay, Jesus is just nuance of it is love like me. And, uh, you know, Moses doesn't say die for your friends, but I do. Okay, this sort of you know, sweet, taking something that's already in the Hebrew Bible and giving it a, a more, a slightly different nuance. So we've got this miraculous bread healing. And, uh, and then you get Naaman, who's a commander in the army of Syria. He's, he's a bad guy. He's part of the occupation forces, right? He's not, not your friend. And uh, he was great and honorable in the eyes of his, his lord. He's obviously a great military leader. He has defeated all the bad guys, and uh, Syria is still ascendant. And, um, and uh, because, because by him, the lord had given him victory. What an interesting thing for the Haftara to say. God is dealing in the affairs of non-Jews. You get these little hints. This is not the only time. There are other hints actually in the Torah. Moses talks about it in Deuteronomy where God has been using other nations to, 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 to kill off the um, giants and this, that, and the other and to move empires around. God has been dealing with the Gentile world. Okay? It's not just Jews. So that should be quite humbling right then and there. Okay? Um, so, uh, but he's also a leper. Okay? He's actually got, got leprosy. And the Syrians had gone out on raids and they brought back a captive girl okay, from Israel. So that actually attacked Israel. Okay? God is working with this pagan Gentile. He's not a believer in God. He's a pagan. And, uh, and they're actually attacking the people of God. God's been working behind the scenes. That should teach us incredible amounts. You know, how do we discern what God is doing in the world? It's not always easy. Gift of discernment, very, very special. And um, you know, sometimes God is actually working in things that we think are the bad guys. And uh, and and yet he is actually working um for good. And um uh they capture this young Israelite girl and she becomes a slave to Naaman's wife. And she says to Naaman's wife, look. If only my master with the prophet who is in Samaria, okay, he would heal him of his leprosy. And uh, Naaman went in and told his uh, master, saying, look, this is what the girl from Israel said. And the king of Assyria, who doesn't get a name, by the way, right? They do this a lot in the Bible. Mountains don't get named. Lots of people don't get names. But just so you know, the uh, Talmud loves to run around and give everybody a name. So if we actually had a look in the rabbinical commentaries, this guy's got a name, backstory, everything. Okay, And uh, many of the times, oddly enough, um, they love to make sure everybody's a really good Torah student. Okay, And you scratch your head and you go, really? The king of Assyria studying the Torah? Why would he do such a thing? Um, they just, just love to have the idea that everybody loves the word of God. Okay, um, So uh, go now and I'll send a letter to the king of Israel. So they obviously you don't want your commander of your armies just to suddenly appear in somebody else's territory that would look like a military invasion send all the wrong signals so the bible is actually recording a very human transaction we better do some shuttle diplomacy before we start international wars here so um he's going to bring some money okay he's going to pay for these things so talents of silver shekels of gold shekel in hebrew is a weight because back here we haven't actually invented coinage yet that's a persian invention up until here um most of your money is in form of livestock and and weights of of precious metals and uh he brings to the king and now here's a piece of bible that's written by pagans okay the uh, now be advised when this letter comes to you that I have sent Naaman, my servant, to you that you may heal him of his leprosy. That's actually not written by a prophet, right? That's not written by the author of Samuel. That's written by a pagan. And when you actually read the, the Old Testament, you discover that there's actually um, people like Nebuchadnezzar writes Daniel chapter 4. Okay, There's actually letters of, of, of all these foreigners becoming sacred scripture. Isn't that very interesting? Okay. Um, and the king of Israel also isn't named at this stage. Uh, he's like, uh-oh, this is really terrible. This guy's picking a fight with me. 
thing as um, uh, am I God to kill and make a lie that this man sends a man to me and heal him of his leprosy? Doesn't even think, okay, that it, uh, Elisha might be able to actually be doing something. Um, so it was when Elisha, the man of God, okay, and uh, that's Ish Elohim, right? um, uh, which is a, uh, an interesting thing. Uh, uh, it says here, Ish Ha Elohim. Which gives you the the um, definitive article, Other, and so that's the man of God. Hence the 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 Moses isn't called that. Moses is just called Ish Elohim, God man. Hmm. Uh, how can Moses be God and man at the same time? And uh, that, there's actually a rabbinical commentary on having a discussion: when is Moses God and when is Moses man? But here, this is a prophet, and this is the man of God. And uh, he hears that the king of Israel is also having a hissy fit and tearing his clothes, very upset, doesn't quite understand what's going on. And uh, so prophets, each king has a prophet, and they're usually at loggerheads. Um, and you end up getting the, 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 the prophetic healing of this pagan ruler. Okay, Naaman went to the with his horses and chariot and stands by the door of Elisha's house, Elisha's house. Now remember, Elisha is the successor to Elijah. And Elisha wanted a double portion of his power and he got it. And so Elisha does twice as many miracles as Elijah does. Yet it's Elijah that we're waiting for, not Elisha. Okay, so there's this, and both of them don't write books. Elijah and Elisha do wonderful things, but they never write a text. And yet, so they they live and operate in the the northern areas of Israel. Oddly enough, based around a, a village called dun, 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 Nazareth. They don't operate in Nazareth, but when you actually draw a map and have a look down where they do all their miracles, it's all around Nazareth. So when Jesus was growing up in Nazareth, he would be walking around the hill territory and the counties and go. That's where Elisha healed the lepers. That's where Elijah did X, Y, Z. Okay, And so, so when you see in, in Luke chapter 4, when Jesus is quoting, he says, Elijah in the days of Elijah and Elisha. He quotes those prophets. Why? Because they were so familiar with him. They are also the only two prophets to ever have the Spirit of God. Everybody else just gets an oracle or a vision, but these ones actually get the, the Ruach Elohim. All right. So Elisha sends a message saying, go wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh will be restored to you and you'll be clean. Naaman says, uh, gets furious. He gets everyone. If you notice, every, everybody's angry all the time. Right? God's angry. David's angry. Everybody's angry. Naaman's angry. The king of Israel's angry. Um, and uh, Naaman's angry. Everyone has a hissy fit. Michal's angry. Um, uh I, I, he will surely come out and meet me. Elisha wouldn't even go out to meet this guy. Okay, the guy, the guy's a Gentile. I don't like. I don't need to talk to you. Um, you've just been busy raiding half the territory, but I'll still touch you. You'll still get healed, but you have to participate in your own healing. You have to go wash. And, um, you know, he says, surely he would have called on the name of the Lord, waved his hand over the place, and healed the leprosy. And then he describes, and why can't I go to the rivers of Damascus, the Arbana and the, the, the Farfar, the rivers of Damascus? Aren't they better than the waters of Israel? Can't I wash in them and be clean? So he, he turns away and he's in rage, just like David had done. And then um, it, uh, the servants say, they call him Father, Avi. And this is a, quite a... Um, these servants may actually have um, become like like his household family, not family family, but consider themselves as we're lifelong servants for you. Uh, if the prophet has told you to do something great, you'd have done it. How much more if he says just wash and be clean? Sometimes we're always looking for the big miracle. We're looking for the uh, something powerful and supercalifragilistic, but sometimes miracles are actually smaller than that. But they're still miracles. Sometimes the things that we do are small, but they have incredible impact. Sometimes the touches that we have in people's lives 
a little word here, a smile there, a lift, taking somebody to the groceries because they've hurt their leg, buying the groceries and bringing them back. Small things that can have unbelievable impacts. So he actually does. He actually does what he's supposed to do. He dips seven times in the Jordan and exactly as the man of God says, and he gets clean. He is, he is healed. So immediately he's back, back to the man of God. And he says, look, now I know that there is no God on earth except those, the God that's in Israel. And please accept a gift. I don't want one. And then Naaman says, "Because look, I'm going to have to bow down to a, a, a statue whom I don't think is God anymore. When I help my, my master bow down because he's not well. Please don't take offense at that. So you're really looking at somebody who has had a heartfelt change and he has been touched by by God. And so this is these are the things that we are learning in um, these Torah portions and in his half half Torah portions in both both of them that we need to learn how to differentiate and discern. We are invited to be part of the discerning process. We have to understand how we impact the world at the same time how the world impacts us. So when you're being salt and light, you have to be 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 warned. You know, you don't send. Uh, Jesus warned his disciples, I'm sending you out as sheep amongst the wolves. Right? You know, uh, they're going to tell you apart. Um, and 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 be wise about this. So, uh, but it can have an incredible impact. Little things can have an incredible impact. They don't have to be big things. They can actually be 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 little things. And let's let's remember that the deeds that we do can be great. Right, just like that little kernel, the thing that God gives, He gives the sun, He gives the rain, but we turn it into bread. You know? And um, so we have to take what God has given us and turn around and, and, and uh, do wonderful things. Yes, for His glory. Yes, for His name, not for our own benefit. Just like Elisha, I don't need anything. Okay, um, it's enough. Go be healed, Mr. Pagan. Um, but God also works in those worlds as well. So there's a lot, lots to learn. So, guys, I invite you all now to join in the discussion. What do you think about the idea of um, doing greater things than God? Aaron, when you talk about um, touch, um, what really came to me is, um, you know, Jesus said that we could do greater things than he mm -hmm. did. So, you you mentioned touch quite a few times and what came to me right away was the laying on of hands Ooh, touching nice. yep. yeah yeah that that's um what automatically came to mind because we do that a lot we lay on of hands while we're praying and we're believing for healing right yep yeah and uh there's this those incidents that you find in the book of Acts where, and we have to remember that sometimes, um, sometimes it does, the Holy Spirit does come upon people by our touch and sometimes it doesn't. So can't, can't, can't um, force God to be, to operate in a certain way. However, having said that laying on of hands can invoke the Holy Spirit because that's, that text is there too. So very important, the, the ability for touch, um, both physical and spiritual. So the rabbis are looking at stuff and they're looking at something physical and they're running to the spiritual. Did you like Rabbi Akiva's little um, anecdote with uh, the Roman? I thought he did quite, I thought he was very clever. I mean, he'd obviously thought about it ahead of time. So yeah. I thought that was quite clever. But, uh, yeah. And I was just thinking um, how the um, people are often touched by our words, by mm -hmm. words of, or by words um, in different me different ways as well. Yes, yes, indeed. Yep. I've um, sometimes met uh, people who I've I've never met um, before. And they will say things like, oh, I saw you online and it really touched me. It's had an incredible effect on my family. Like, oh, wow, amazing. Sometimes, sometimes you have no idea how you're touching others. 
uh, although there is the belief that we are, that we actually are doing something that's actually greater than, than ourselves and uh, sometimes even greater than as the deeds of God, which is actually what we've been called to do, right? even by our master. So. so this sort of connection between this, the sacred and the common is quite interesting. Why do you think that um, there were the, all these dietary laws? Was it, I mean, some of it was sort of like, you can understand, could could be animals that may make you sick if they're sort of vulture types or whatever, right? But why do you think that these laws were there in the first place? Okay, that's a good question. So when they were going to be taken away later on in Peter's dream. Right. Uh, well, the food isn't. That's the thing. So um, remember, Peter has a vision of clean and unclean animals, but it's not related to clean and unclean animals. It's related to Gentiles being called unclean. So Peter says, I have never eaten an unclean animal. So how long has Peter spent with Jesus? Like all, his, all, his, all, of his, all of his discipleship. So obviously Jesus hasn't said to Peter, you can eat whatever you like. Okay, that's actually an interpoliation that's been put into the Gospel of Mark. So it's always in italics, always in a bit. You know, they said, By saying this, Jesus has made all foods clean. Now that's a, that's a statement of, um, by somebody else that's been put into the text. Now before you all jump to conclusions, um, there is a rabbinic discussion on what happens to the Torah when the Messiah comes. What do they mean by that? So there's, when the Messiah comes, I mean, that's the great hope. That's the great dream. That's the advent of our eternal salvation. Messiah has arrived. So now what is the point of the Torah? Right? Because the, the goal of the Torah was to get Messiah. So um, now that he's here, now what happens? And there'll be this one stream of Judaism, which will say even Messiah will keep the Torah. What are you talking about? No change. And there's another change that says, no, no, when the Torah comes, when Messiah comes, there's changes in the Torah. And uh, there's a rabbi called Rabbi Rashi, who's in the Middle Ages, uh, 11th century, so 10 hundreds, late 10 hundreds. And he says, uh, in the days of the Messiah, pig returns to Israel. Okay, so that he believed that in the days of the Messiah, kosher laws go different because the kosher laws were there because they're not for sin. They were for cleanliness and uncleanliness, for purity and impurity. They were for differentiation. So this differentiated Jews from Gentiles. And they go, so it had nothing to do with, with sin. It was a differentiation between Jews and Gentiles. And when the Messiah comes, there's no differentiation between Jews and Gentiles. There's still Jews and there are still Gentiles, but there's no differentiation between Jews and Gentiles. And so therefore, the food laws can change. And so there's actually a modern book called The Return of the Kosher Pig. Okay, where there's actually, it's a, it's a modern book where they have a discussion. Hey, you know, when the Messiah comes, uh, what do you think, guys? You know, to the two all the food laws, especially all the dumb, dumber food food laws we've we've made these days, um, and so the the and so this this is one of those discussions which is a hot topic here in Israel, obviously, and for messianics everywhere around the world. What can we and can we not eat, and and how can we do it? Um, and it was such a big deal that uh, and even if you're full of the spirit, that doesn't mean you get it right. Right? Peter was full of the spirit from John twenty, Acts two, and all that kind of stuff, and he still didn't know he was allowed to eat with Gentiles. Okay, and so he actually goes to Cornelius in Acts ten, shares the gospel, they all get saved, and then in Acts eleven, he's brought to Jerusalem, and they don't say, "Wow, did the Holy Spirit come upon Gentiles? You gave Gentiles the gospel." Their charge is, "Did you eat with them?" Right? These are Jewish Christians, and they're not. They're going, "Oh, miracles aside, did you actually eat with them? What are you nuts?" Um, and uh, and so he says, "Look, it, the Messiah's come. I've begun to learn." blend this a little. The Maccabees did this too, but they did it in a slightly different way. So the, during the Maccabean period, they believed that they were living in the Messianic era. They were the Messianic heroes. And uh, so they could bend the Torah a little bit. And the bit that they bent was, you don't have to have Levites as priests. You could be a non-Levite. And so they put their own families in as priests. So by the time you get to Jesus, like Caiaphas and all them, 
they're not even supposed to be there. They're not Le Levitical priests anymore. Uh, where do all the Levites go? I hear you ask. Okay, well, some of them are what we call the Dead Sea Scrolls people. The, they've, they've fled the temple, they've run to the desert to await the Messiah, and they write nasty letters about the temple, calling them all corrupt and everything. So it sort of kind of puts that into perspective. So for, for, for Jewish believers, they've got to struggle with this themselves. Can I or can I not um, have a ham and cheese sandwich? And what does that actually mean for me? And, and what witness does that give? How is that? And this is where you need to discern. If I start eating ham and cheese sandwiches because I'm now free in the Messiah, how's that touching my neighbors? So they got, they got to really figure this out. And it's a thing we all should should try and for ourselves too. You know, if um, if you've got a vegetarian friend, obviously you're not going to bring them over for dinner and put a steak in front of them, you know, and start quoting Paul by saying, people who eat vegetables a week, you know, and say, so so in the Bible, you know. Um, yeah, so we we have, we have to use that. Uh, we're invited to to make a discerning a discernment. So, like for, for me, uh, when I'm here in Israel, obviously um, I don't eat, eat pork. Uh, when I'm in England, it's the only non-halal food. <laughs> how how weird? Okay, how's that one for you know the the the, the only food that's uh, not halal is is. Uh, this speaks. All righty. Any other thoughts? Um, just to follow that up, I was just, uh, it's very confusing to me. It always has been the, you know, the eating laws, right? But it's encouraging that it's not linked to a sin, right? It is not. And it's not for Gentiles. Right, this is for Israel. So, okay. Right. This is this this one of those things where um, you know um, you get this this uh, you get lovely, well-meaning Gentile Christians going up to Jews or rabbis and having debates and things and saying, because of Jesus, we're not under the law. And rabbis scratch their head and go, "You never were." That was that was for Israel. Um, and they're like, yes, well, well, we're not under the law. Like, we, we're agreeing with you. You know, it's like, uh, what, what, how does that make Jesus of the Messiah? Um, remember, when, when, when Paul does his arguments that Jesus is the Messiah, he does it from the scriptures. He doesn't turn around and he, he, he then chastises uh, Gentiles who are trying to, to, to identify uh, in Jewish ways when, when they, they don't need to do that. And saying that it was a, a requirement, so because there was a, a a movement at the time of Jesus and, and and before of God fearers, so this was already Gentiles already doing certain certain um, halakhically uh, good things, mm. but at the same time, let's remember that every utterance from God is pure. That means that Gentiles can read this too. Because Gentiles were at Mount Sinai, they were also hearing the voice of God. If the instructions of God are good, what do we learn from them? How do we apply them? How do we let them touch us? You know, and so we all constantly wrestle with the Torah, including Gentiles, and uh, embrace it, and learn from it, and uh, and put it into practice. Right. So we need to learn learn the discernment process. We need to, to discern right from wrong. And Aaron. All. Yep, Linda. So are we not you yeah, we're Gentiles, but are we not grafted in? We are. Yeah. But, <laughs> but that doesn't mean that now suddenly you you take all the Jewish laws, which are meant to, to differentiate Jews. So Jews and Gentiles right. still call Jews and Gentiles, but and you, yeah. you listen to the Torah and you can apply, but there's 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 no way to apply all of the Torah onto yourself. Yeah. Not possible. Yeah. First of all, heart, like that rule in, in verse 11 or verse 12 only applies to women. Yes. So for me, there's a piece of the Torah I can't apply for myself. This is not possible. Right. Right. And, and, but, and I can, but I can apply, the, I can apply the spiritual <laughs> principle. 
Because remember, right. Um, right from word go, what do the rabbis say? Um, what letter should the, should the Bible have started with? Do you remember? Should oh, have hello. started with an aleph, but it starts with oh. a bet. So the the spirit of the law is always better. And um, and and I was actually just having this discussion yesterday. I was writing it out in in my commentary to the lectionary. Um. Uh, Here's, you should never put words into God's mouth. And here's something that God never said. He did not say, stop following my commandments. Yeah. Right? That's, he never said that. And so, um, and so what he does, he, what Jesus does say is, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So, so, we have to learn okay, what does it mean to keep God's commandments, which is what we're all we're all wrestling with. And the commandments are also the Torah and mm -hmm. uh, the teachings and the instructions of God. And, uh, and so this is the this is the quest, the, the lifelong journey as students of God, students of Jesus, students of the Bible. We're wrestling with these things, learning, discerning, applying, making them practical, making them applicable. Um, uh, and so. Abraham in Genesis 26 5, it says, God, Abraham kept my Torahs in plural. But how could he possibly do that? He didn't have the Torah. So whenever someone says, Aaron, how do you keep the Torah? I go, it's very easy. It's the same as um, it's the same as uh, uh, Abraham. And then they'll say, but that's legalistic. I say, no, 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 no. Legalism is when you pick and choose which commandments to follow. Okay. Because if you kept every commandment, that wouldn't be legalism. You would never be able to be charged with legalism because you'd be perfect. You'd be the most exceptional person on the planet. Well, it'd be Jesus. Right? Um, and so we have to understand what legalism really is. It's not the fact that you are trying to earn your way into heaven. It's that you're picking and choosing. Um, what we need to embrace is the teachings and the instructions of God, which is exactly what we're doing here. We're taking a commandment where there's a childbirthing thing, and all of a sudden we're applying the deep spiritual things we can learn from it. Where, where, and which is, you know, um, which is a good thing. So. And also, Aaron, um, you talk a lot about discernment, and I really like that because, you know, we really need to discern before we take action, you know. Yep. yep. Yeah. Fools rush in. Yeah. Thank you so much. Great oh, teaching. Thank you, sister. Yes. Fantastic. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, beautiful okay. people. Yep. I hope you have a fantastic Shabbat. I hope that you have a great rest or whatever it is that you would like to do. Um, I'm going to cook a meal for Mutze Shabbat with my well, a Messianic believer here who's sheltering in our house because there's no tourists for him yet still. So we'll, uh, okay. and, uh, and he guards. He guards the Sabbath. So he wouldn't um, eat, he, he wouldn't eat any food if I gave it to him if I'd cooked it before the before Shabbat ended. So there you go. I'm keeping <laughs> that part of the Torah. So very and yeah. very happy to do so. And Aaron, also um, just a question off of this topic. Um, Micah, is he back in service? He comes back on Tuesday. Okay. And, uh, then he will. Uh, he will contact his commander, his old commander, who's still yeah. in Gaza because they they withdrew. Actually, I'll better stop this recording. Sorry, guys. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say stop your recording.